It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 310 of Science on Top. Today is Sunday the 16th of September 2018. I'm Ed Brown and with me is Penny Dumsday. Hello. And Lucas Randall. Hey. And today we'll be talking about an ancient hashtag, a self-aware fish, and a rise in shark attacks and dolphins. But first... And I've got to say it again, we are going to have such a fun night when Dr. Pamela Gay gives her Astronomy Revolution talk. She is one of the best science communicators I know of, uh, a brilliant astronomer in her own right, and just one of the coolest and smartest people in the game. So she'll be talking about novel technologies in astronomy and then doing a question and answer session. So bring your questions, anything you want to know about space, the universe, she'll be happy to answer them. And after that, we'll be doing a live recording of the podcast. So that's on Wednesday, the 10th of October at 7pm in Carlton here in Melbourne. Tickets are on sale now, just $20 each at scienceontop.com slash live. And all proceeds go to the non-profit Astronomical Society of the Pacific at scienceontop.com slash live. And then that weekend, up in Sydney, Pamela Gay and a host of other extraordinary speakers will be at the Australian Skeptics National Convention. You can go and see archaeologists, journalists, psychologists, cancer researchers, paranormal investigators, everyone, you name it. If they're interesting, they'll be talking or on a panel at the Skeptics National Convention on the 13th and 14th of October up in Sydney. Just go to convention.skeptics.com.au And the last announcement, if you can't make it to any of those events or if you just want to help us out in some way, scienceontop.com slash donate is where to go to become a Patreon and help us cover the costs of doing this show for you every week. Now, let's start with a look at some ancient cave drawings. And Penny, we seem to be frequently finding older and older rock paintings, cave drawings, depictions of animals. I think it was at the end of last year we talked about the oldest depiction of dogs on Saudi Arabian rock art from about 5,000 years ago. Or 5,000 BC, I think it might have even been. But now we've got some 73,000 year old drawings from the Blombus Cave in South Africa. Do you want to tell us about this? Yeah. Yeah. So I think what I I always find these stories fascinating because they're asking such a huge question and it's one that we just can't ever really, really know. And it's we know that people evolved from uh, animals that, you know, that didn't have our qualities and traits that make us feel as if we're unique. But, you know, how did it happen and what were their lives like and what were these people like and could we have could we connect with them or not? And I mean, we'll never know because all that's left is a few scraps. So this, as Ed said, you know, we've, we've covered a few of these oldest this and oldest that in the field of um, human art. This is one of the oldest drawings or the oldest drawing. So it's not the oldest engraving or the oldest abstract art or, you know, but it's the oldest drawing. So it's been made with kind of a crayon made out of ochre, which is a, a red mineral that you can grind up to make paint this one was done as a drawing and it's been found in on a, on a fragment of rock in a cave. So it's, it's a piece of this picture and I found it really interesting. I mean, I don't know if looking at the picture of the rock, if I would have even recognised no. that as um, no. They look like human. some random markings on a bit of rock. They do and they don't to me necessarily because I, I, with my untrained eye, you know, they don't look like sort of intentional human markings, but I mean, I would completely trust that they are and the the way that they've been made has been replicated by the archaeological team. So it seems likely that they were made by people and that they're a really symbolic, intentional creation rather than 
just marks made as a byproduct of doing something else. So these people that lived in the cave, they were making lots of ochres and paints. It was described as a workshop. There were stones for grinding and hammering ochre, rods for stirring the paste, abalone shells to store it in and so on. And there was lots of engravings found, but not so many drawings. So this drawing was found and it's quite significant because I was thinking, well, if we know people are making, you know, engravings, what's the significance of a drawing? But they made the point that a drawing is more portable. So if you're sitting, if you're engraving a shell or a piece of rock, you know, you're sitting down and slowly chiseling it away. A drawing can just kind of be portable. You can carry an ochre crayon, crayon with you and draw it wherever you like. So in a way it's, it's, it's able to be almost instantaneous communication if that's what these were intended for. And I mean, just thinking about me, I mean, I, have never really been formally trained in art or anything like that. You know, I'm not an artist. It's not my way. I'm just a pretty ordinary person in that respect. When I doodle, like I'll do kind of crosshatch patterns and diagonal patterns and I would find it very hard to tell you what they meant. They don't really mean anything, but it's something that I find quite, you know, satisfying to do. So I can see that this this art we we know we're never really going to know what it meant, but it was um, it was drawn it was drawn by people. We really again we don't know the context if it's meaningful like a signature or a tally, or if it's just random doodles. Random doodles because but, they they do yeah. just look like a few sort of diagonal uh, cross markings on this small one and a half inch long piece of stone. Uh, they do. They don't seem to, to me, to represent anything, but it could also be this is just a small fragment of a larger uh, drawing perhaps. Yeah, it could be. And it could be that, you know, it it might not be a representational drawing, like, you know, a drawing of an animal or a dog or something, but, um, yeah, some other kind of creation entirely. I mean, yeah, I, I don't know. But I, I've really did find this interesting because it did make me think about how it's not just like, oh, someone sitting down going, today I'm going to invent art and then all of a sudden, bam, every single <laughs> human being is like doing art. Sure. Like, and, you know, all different kinds of art. So it is, yeah, like just part of that process of human development, which is fascinating. And how do we know that it's at least 70,000 years old? Was there some sort of carbon dating or is that based on other artifacts found nearby or ah oh, i'm not actually i sh- sure i don't know if you'd be able to carbon date it because of what it's um made from i'm guessing it will be from the the archaeological layer mm-hmm. that it was found in and the other kinds of uh things that have been found in that layer as well but um let me just check if i can it, it does say and one of the and this is in the atlantic the story by ed young Uh, He says, chemical tests reassured him. They showed the signatures of two distinct kinds of ochre, one from the red lines and another from the rock itself. Oh, there you go. Because I actually, I don't know if it's for everyone or just I was lucky. For some reason, the the actual paper is available Ah. in nature. But I find that a lot more difficult going than the articles in the Atlantic and so on. But I have been looking at the paper. Sorry. No, it's fine. It's good. Um, I mean, there's so many things that I'm tempted to, uh, I'm tempted to draw from this, yeah. um, but we really can't because it's pure speculation. Like I wanted to say, uh, maybe this shows that there is some sort of a group, a society, a culture that they are communicating or whatever. It could be just one lone hermit just doodling on a rock, sort of thing. We really can't draw any conclusions from this other than there were humans or neanderthals probably humans i think uh who were drawing with uh, ochre seventy three thousand years ago that's all we can really say Hmm. and that's that's what i was trying to get at at the intro like it's so fascinating Hmm. we want to take our mind so many places you want to imagine them sitting in the cave what were they talking about you know Hmm. but we can't really we're never going to get there Yep. Like I can't imagine any kind of scientific technique that will get us there. 
Unless, but it doesn't stop you wondering nah, and imagining. Of but you never know. There might be some great discovery found when you know some rock, a cliff face falls away or something, revealing mm. magnificent drawings. I don't know. It was an English footnote. I drew this, and it means this, <laughs> and that's what it's for. <laughs> yeah, it's all a hoax. Yeah, no, it's always interesting when we uncover a little bit more about prehistoric times. But let's move on now. And Lucas, surfers will sometimes tell you that uh, dolphins are a good sign that there are no sharks around. You'll be safe if you go swimming in that uh, area of the beach. But new research demonstrates that's not necessarily the case. And in fact, shark attacks on dolphins have been on the rise, uh, particularly in West Australia. And this could be linked to rising sea temperatures. Yeah, I, I was a little bit uh, surprised in reading this that that, um, that, I guess, that rule of thumb, that old wives' tale or old surface tale about if there's dolphins around you, you, uh, you're you probably safe from sharks is, is a fairly Australian thing. I didn't realise mm-hmm. that. Um, but, yeah, I've certainly heard that plenty of times in the past that uh, if there's dolphins around, you know, they, uh, they chase away sharks and so forth. In fact, I kind of vaguely recall that being something that might have come up in Flipper, Back in the day, it's probably before your time, you young, young, youngling. I vaguely remember Flipper. He was faster <laughs> yeah. than lightning, I believe. <laughs> yeah, so um, so this is something that I've just always had in the back of my mind that that uh, the dolphins around are a sign that you, you there's no sharks around. And well, certainly in this area uh, off off the uh, the West Australian uh, South coast southwest coast of uh, Bunbury and Brusselton uh, Bustleton rather that that appears to not be the case there was a uh, a fairly long study that was conducted by the Southwest Marine Research Program uh, who are partnered up with a number of organizations and they found that uh, in the in a, a whole lot of dolphins 343 dolphins that they assessed uh, in those waters about 17 percent of them were found to have had scars and bite wounds arising from encounters with sharks. Now, that's a fairly high percentage. And if you consider that these are dolphins that survived encounters with sharks, by and large, uh, because they were alive, um, (laughs) uh, that means that there would have been a whole lot of other dolphins that, well, didn't survive Mm -hmm. and therefore were not a part of the study. So it does beg the question, well, you know, how common are these events of, of dolphins being bitten by sharks. So the sharks that were most likely involved were both great whites and tiger sharks, as identified predominantly by their uh, the, the distinctive bite patterns. But what was very interesting was, well, there's a few things. First of all, the incidence of bites rapidly and significantly increased in sheltered waters, which was very interesting. So they, they found that 25% of dolphins in, in sheltered waters had uh, bite wounds compared to about 13% in coastal waters. Of course, that averaged out over the study. So the 343 would have been across both of those locations. So the incidence was higher in the sheltered waters. And the, the, the hypothesis around that is that in the shallow waters, perhaps the dolphins have got less space to manoeuvre. Yeah, uh, so they can't, can't really away. sort of. Yeah, they can't get away as as, as easily because that's that's obviously something they've got in their favour when they're when they're in, when they do encounter a much larger predator like a especially a great white and a tiger shark. Um, they they are a lot smaller, so they can manoeuvre a lot better and they're very fast. So you know, if they haven't got the all of the dimensions available to them to, to manoeuvre in, that would be a problem. But um, but also they felt that perhaps they, it might be more difficult in these areas for the dolphins to actually detect the predators because of all of the other wa- noise underwater, like from ships and boats and things like that in the mm. in the water that's close up to uh, to the shore. So so that's another possibility. But as you mentioned in the in the intro, Ed, something else that's that's emerged out of the study in terms of the the patterns in the data was that the bites actually increased in frequency year by year uh, of the study, ranging from 2009 to 2013. And apparently the 2011 La Nina uh, conditions was was a a real key thing lining up with the the spike in bites around that period of time. So it does seem to indicate that there's uh, some sort of um, link between... 
Yeah, a correlation between the uh, you know the the water temperatures and the amount of dolphins being bitten. So yeah, it was a very interesting study, and I and I'm I've, I've actually started digging into more, and I have got a, a, a copy of the paper that I'm going to actually digest a little bit, and might uh, reach out to uh, Dr. Kate Norton at some point and have a chat with her about it if she knows much about this. It'll be really really cool if we could get uh, the lead author, uh, Dr. Kate uh, Sprogus, on the on the show. That would be awesome sure, if we can reach out to her. But um, uh, very, yeah, very, very interesting because um, cause normally, so Dr. Uh, Dr. Uh, Sprogus normally, um, she does most of her studies, it seems, from what I've read on bottlenose dolphins. And, and these are the, the dolphins that were primarily impacted upon by these, these sharks. So, um, you know, she's done a lot of study on the, on the predatory behavior of dolphins uh, as well. So, mm-hmm. um, and how they're affected by, uh, uh, by water temperatures and so forth too. So that would be really cool if we could, uh, we could discuss that in more detail, but yeah, very interesting. So this, this is one of these things that you, we don't know. We just don't know what the ongoing impact is going to be from, from climate change. And, you know, these, um, as, as temperatures, uh, change, the conditions change. Obviously we've, we've had guests on the show discussing the, the impact on the underwater, you know, kelp uh, forests and so yep. forth that, yep. that go down the, the West Coast. So the, the impact that that will have, obviously you start to get migrations of various uh, species. So there'll, there'll be a whole lot of species displacement, one would imagine, as, as species move to, to areas that are more appropriate for them. So well, we're already uh, seeing that with the spread of the northern sea star, which is a, an invasive absolutely. species that's uh, causing a lot of havoc uh, in the colder yeah. Summer. I get them down the bottom of my driveway now. It's really bizarre. They've just never that been in the area before. Because you're yeah. nowhere near the sea. Yeah, that's <laughs> odd. Oh, right about um, <laughs> they're really they're, they're moving way out from where uh, where they you know they're known to be. So yeah, it's having a big impact on the local uh, wombat population. That's not true. Now you're yeah you're just being <laughs> silly now, being very silly. I did think it was interesting, though, on the ABC uh, website when where I read this. One of the there are a few photos with really nasty looking oh, yeah. wounds uh, yeah. on the dolphins from the sharks. One of them has the caption: "A dolphin bearing a substantial bite mark, thought to be from either a tiger or great white shark." Now, probably <laughs> wasn't the, a tiger. Yeah, this is where... <laughs> I think it was a tiger shark, possibly, or a great white shark. But I just it was uh, an yeah. interesting phrase. But yeah, those those wounds were mm. um, were ghastly. Some of them were really, really Huge. ghastly. In fact, one of the one of the um, series of photographs that I came across on the uh, link to the main story from the main story to the Murdoch University. Uh, uh, press release has got a series of photos there which are, are very very confronting but uh, apparently the the dolphin with this very large bite out of its its uh, back uh, died just 10 days later yeah. um, so yeah you can imagine that uh, it's uh, oh yeah I'm just looking at them now I should stop scrolling down that page and go to another page yeah that nature is red in gruesome. tooth and claw it's not always a happy nice place but mm, indeed uh, and also, I think it's important to point out, uh, you mentioned climate change. This is a br- very brief window that we're looking at from 2009 to 2013 or whatever it is. So this is a yeah. weather-related event, those rising sea temperatures. But of course, climate change is going to raise uh, sea temperatures across the globe. Uh, and it is something to be careful of. But this is not directly attributable to climate change. Yes and no. I mean, because we know that the the um, severity of oscillations is increasing because there's more energy involved. So, and that that actually was a period of time of of not not significant rise. It actually bucked the trend a little bit in that period of time. So, so yes. You're, although you're quite right, there's nothing short term, right, about about climate change we know that and local conditions are not a good indicator of climate change but we do know that there's more energy in systems and therefore oscillations and weather events become more significant and that's a prediction that was made a very long time ago and it, it yeah. didn't, we've just we've just seen a, a, a rather significant hurricane mm, over in the US yes. that that um, you know was was drawing just uh, incredible uh, energy out of the the very warm uh, oceans uh, that that they have over there at the moment yep absolutely right and it's only going to get worse i think at the moment but um speaking of bottlenose dolphins penny only a few animals have passed the infamous mirror test the bottlenose dolphin is one 
also killer whales, some primates like bonobos and orangutans, elephants, humans. a few birds, humans, but only after I think it's about 18 months. Um, but the of cleaner- intensive training? <laughs> <laughs> Not usually. But the cleaner wrasse could be the first fish to have passed the mirror test. So do you want to tell us what this mirror test actually is? Yeah, and I, I found this really surprising. I'm so not qualified to make any judgments about this story, so I'm just going to present it. But, I mean, my first thought was, aren't fish dumb? Like, <laughs> maybe a shark could be smart, but generally are they dumb? Anyway, so the mirror test is to see if an animal can recognise itself in a mirror, which, as Ed said, is it's a pretty restricted group of animals that we've found are able to do that. And it's not even all humans because humans can't do it from birth. Like they have to live for 18 months of like, if not intense training, at least I think anyone who's seen a little baby grow up into a toddler, intense study of the world Mm. before they realize that what they're looking at in a mirror is themselves. And the way that you can tell if a kid or the way that a test is done, if a kid or a child or organism can recognize itself is you pop them in front of the mirror and you put some paint or something weird on their forehead. And if they look at the image in the mirror and then touch their own forehead, you think, ah, they know that the image is of them. But if they reach in the mirror. Yeah. Unless they're actually going, dude, there's something on you. There's a thing on you. (laughs) Oh, never mind. Yeah. But you know, (laughs) so they did this experiment with these fish So they were put into tanks with mirrors and seen how they reacted to their reflections. And the first observation was that they did exhibit unusual behaviour with the mirror. So they would dash quickly in front of it. And this was interpreted as thinking, well, maybe they were learning that they're not looking at another fish but at themselves. Then they applied coloured rubber marks or tags to under the skin of the fish and what seemed to happen is when the fish saw themselves in the mirror, they tried to remove the marks by rubbing their bodies against surfaces in the tanks, which, you know, obviously wow. a fish can't say that's me. And yeah. they did try and put the marks in a place where it's only visible to the fish in the mirror. So that not like somewhere where it could see it on its own body anyway, yeah. like on their throat. Yeah. And so these fish started scraping their throats And that's not a behaviour that the researchers had seen before. So they also tried putting an invisible mark in case, you know, maybe Mm -hmm. the the marking process was irritating them and making them scrape their throat and they didn't exhibit the behaviour, nor did they exhibit the behaviour when there was a coloured spot but no mirror. So they only did that when they saw the mark in the mirror. So four of them had marks on their throats and three showed signs of self-recognition. So this paper hasn't been sort of peer reviewed. It's not, you know, finalised yet. But it is obviously, like, really interesting. Like, Mm. the apparently the three species which have the most absolutely compelling, rigorous, reproducible evidence are chimps, orangutans and humans. I feel like I can see a common denominator there (laughs) that is not present with cleaner rats. So... I mean, there are possible criticisms for this study. The The marks used look a bit like parasites that they get. So maybe they're kind of hardwired to, oh, if I seek to respond to a parasite-like blemish. So uh-huh. even, and, and like you said, even your explanation, like, oh, there's a fish with its throat infected. I'll, they might respond in a way that encourages that other fish to, Scrape um, it clean off. itself. So it is possible that these behaviours don't necessarily recognise like self-recognition per se, but there are behaviours that have evolved, you know, inside of a group situation. Um, it could also be that they're called cleaner wrasses. So if they see a mark, they have to clean it off. That's just, it's in the name. It's the job title. <laughs> Maybe, I don't know. Yeah, and I mean, I guess there's all sorts of other ways that you could see if this can be reproduced, you know, mark them in a different way, so on. Like put one with a 
a mark in with one that's clean and see what happens if there's no mirror around. Like there's all sorts of things that can be done. But, I mean, just just for me as essentially a lay person reading this this um, study, I'm like, that's, you know, that's interesting. That is worth finding out more about, even if it turns out that they're not self-aware and they can't recognize themselves that's still interesting. And if they can recognize themselves, isn't it interesting that that aspect of self-awareness has evolved in an organism that, look, I'm just going to stereotype fish and say, you know, that is kind of dumb in a lot of other ways. And it's, you know, it just doesn't have the sophisticated kind of intelligence that something like a chimpanzee or a dolphin or, you know, or that we associate with many mammals. So yeah, I find this fascinating. I was like, wow, a self-aware fish, like this has to be a joke, but it wasn't a joke. <laughs> um, but also it's like yeah. uh, Lucas was saying before the show, uh, how does this even evolve this ability? Like where do they see mirrors in the ocean? They wouldn't anyway. even see any reflective surfaces yeah. in the ocean, surely. Like a, like a, a mammals, shiny rock, maybe. You know, primates or whatever could see reflections in water surfaces, right? But mm. the fish are in water, so they can't see reflections in that. So that, that really stuns me that they could possibly draw the link between what they're seeing is is anything anything other than themselves. That that's just that's mm. stunning to me. There are some shiny fish that maybe are a bit like a mirror, but even then <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, but they're more sort of iridescent, aren't they? They kind yeah. of reflect re- reflect um, away from themselves unevenly, not like a mirror. So, I mean, maybe. I don't know. I'd, I'd, I'd love to know. If anyone knows, if there are reflective mirror-like things in the ocean, I'd, I'd love to know about it because I, I can't think of anything. I did get to, uh, I briefly started looking into the mirror test and some of the animals that have failed. There are quite a few primates that have failed mm. the mirror test. So, gibbons, macaques, baboons... Uh, there's a few birds, and I thought I thought it was interesting that in terms of mammals, the giant panda failed it. And I can only assume that if you put a big black mark on a panda's face, it just feeds a different <laughs> panda. I mean, I don't recognise that My- panda. It's that's that's what a panda is. Um, yeah, I suppose you'd have to use like fluorescent or something when you're on a panda. Well, that's our show then. And as always, all the links we talked about are in the show notes and on the web at scienceontop.com slash 310. Get your tickets to the Australian Skeptics National Convention in Sydney on October 13th and 14th at convention.skeptics.com.au and book your tickets to see Dr. Pamela Gay and us for our live show in Melbourne on October 10th at scienceontop.com slash live. And as always, just go to scienceontop.com slash donate to become a Patreon. Thanks for joining me today, Penny and Lucas. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Ed. And thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back again next week, putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. What would it be like smoking weed in space, just out of curiosity? What do you think would actually happen? Well... The problem is, in space now, many things will kill you. So, if you do anything to alter your understanding of what is reality, that's not in the interest of your health. So if you want to get high in space, you can like, lock yourself in your cabin and don't come out. Because you could break stuff. Fair enough. Inadvertently. Okay. Okay? That's how that, how that goes. <laughs> <Good for laughs>